The history of video games has been documented by many people across many different forms of media. There's a long had debate over what was the first actual video game. But since this is the history of console gaming, we're going to jump in where our story begins. Well, sort of. For a long time, a man named Nolan Bushnell was credited as being the father of video games. Well, our guest this afternoon has been called the P.T. Barnum of Silicon Valley and widely acknowledged as the father of the video game industry. He created Pong and 35 other video games while chairman of Atari. He also is the founder of Pizza Time Theater. And if that's not enough, he's currently working on personal robots for home use. As a matter of fact, you'll see how one works this afternoon right here on People Are Talking. But first of all, let's welcome creative genius Nolan Bushnell. Many believed he was the spark that ignited the home console craze, myself included. But there was another man, a man who had been working on designs for home consoles well before Nolan was even a teenager. In 1922, that man was born to Lottie Kirschbaum and Leo Baer, a Jewish family who had been living in Germany at the time. His name was Rudolf Heinrich Baer, but he went by the name Ralph. By the time Ralph hit the age of 14, there was an anti-Jewish legislation passed. The Nazi government disguised the effort as a concern for overcrowding in the schools and would only allow 1.5% of students to be Jewish. So with this, Ralph was expelled from his current school and was forced to attend an all Jewish school. Ralph's family was scared of the direction Germany was headed and in 1938, they fled to New York City. Ralph continued to self-educate while working in a factory making $12 a week. But one day, his life took a different route. While waiting at a bus stop, he noticed an advertisement about getting an education in the growing field of electronics. And he went all in. Quitting his job to focus on studies full time, Ralph graduated from National Radio Institute in 1940 as a radio service technician. In 1943, Ralph was drafted to the military to fight in World War II. He was assigned to the Military Intelligence Division. He served one year in the States, then was sent overseas where he was assigned to the United States Army Headquarters in London, but was stationed in France for his remaining two years in the military. Immediately after leaving the military, he returned to academics. He took advantage of the GI Bill and headed to the American Television Institute of Technology in Chicago to study television engineering. He graduated in 1949 with a Bachelor of Science degree in the field and started working as chief engineer for an electromedical equipment firm called Wappler Inc. There he designed and built things like surgical cutting machines and low frequency pulse generating muscle toning equipment. By 1951, he had left Wappler and began working as a senior engineer for Laurel Electronics in Bronx, New York. There, he would go on to design power line carrier signal equipment. This technology would allow for data to be sent across a conductor at the same time as an electrical current. He also developed time punch clocks, analog computers for military airborne radar systems that were used for tracking submarines, and developed a complete black and white television receiver. This is also when he first got the idea to use televisions for video games. He pitched the idea of having a built-in video game to help set themselves apart from the rest of the market. As Ralph puts it in his short write-up called Genesis, how the home video games industry began, management said no and that was that. He then worked at Transitron Inc. in New York City from 1952 to 1956 as chief engineer and later as vice president of engineering. The company developed components and products for use in both computers and military equipment. After this, he ended up working for Sanders Associates, a defense contractor in Nashua, New Hampshire. Ralph was hired as staff engineer to the manager of the equipment design division. But by 1957, he had transitioned to manager of electronic design department in the equipment design division. Then in 1958, he became the division manager and chief engineer for equipment design where he ran eight departments and was in charge of overseeing around 500 technical and support personnel. 
During all of this, he was still thinking about the possibilities of home video games. By 1966, it was estimated that 75% of homes now owned a home television. Ralph realizing this was no small number, he was even more determined. On the last day in August of 1966, Ralph was waiting at a bus stop for a colleague to arrive for a business meeting. That's when something clicked. He started writing notes in a spiral notebook about the use of a consumer home TV set to play games. Sadly, this note has been lost to time, but he did manage to keep the disclosure document that he wrote up the next morning. This document describes his idea on using home TVs for games and had a list of different types of games that might work. Some of these game types were action games, board games, sports games, chase games, and many others. Ralph says, what I had in mind at the time was to develop a small game box that would do neat things and cost perhaps $25 at retail. Ralph got one of the division engineers to read, date, and sign the document in order to create a legal record. He presented this idea to one of his supervisors who ended up giving him the okay to start proceeding with the project. Early on, Ralph worked after hours and crafted his own breadboard to test out his early ideas. He created some symbol generators that he eventually got around to testing on a TV that was in one of the labs. With the help of a technician named Bob Tremblay, they got the game working. The game worked by using something Ralph called spot generators. They would modulate a transmitter and they did so on channels three or four. Any kid growing up in the 80s, 90s remembers hooking up their TV and having to play games on channels three or four. This is when that all started. Ralph was able to generate two spots that could chase each other around on the screen. This gave him new confidence to continue pushing, and it was enough to convince some others to allow him to set up a closed area within the Canal Street facility. Ralph was allotted $2,500 in the help of two engineers. Those engineers were Bill Harrison and Bill Rush. The team had a single lab bench and a desk. The room was off limits to the rest of the staff. Only the close-knit team of three had access. But with the room's close proximity to the elevator on that floor, the rumor mill began to churn. Folks walking by would hear sounds coming from that room that they hadn't heard before, and they wanted to know what was going on behind those walls. By 1967, Bill Rush had fully moved his desk into the secret room, and the team had purchased a 19-inch RCA color TV. They had games running in color. Hockey games were played on blue ice, ping pong had a green background. They were truly onto something special. Around the same time, they had got a working version of the concept. Ralph, together with Sanders Associates, started working on patent disclosures. By early 1968, it was made official. Ralph Baer was unquestionably the father of video games when his patent was issued. They continued working on different game types based off the idea of two spots on screen. One of them actually used a light gun that Bear had the team craft from a plastic gun. Manufacturing costs were too high at the time, so Ralph had the idea to pitch these games to cable companies. With cable not performing incredibly well at the time, Ralph thought they could team up and transmit these games straight to people's television sets through the cable line. See, how it would work is the cable company would broadcast different play fields for different games. Customers would still need to own a home game unit, but the unit would work in conjunction with the cable feed in real time and allow for them to achieve visuals that were not obtainable yet using the game unit alone. He also drafted up an idea of a TV quiz show where people could play live from their homes. Players would be presented with a question and then four different answers. Each answer would have a color assigned to it. Players would then use the light gun to shoot the answers they thought were correct. A green light on the gun would light up if they were right, and a red one if they were wrong. He applied for this patent, and in March of 1968, it was the very first patent issued for interactive games or quizzes. By 1969, and after seven different versions of what they were calling the TV game unit, they had created an early prototype that was capable of playing different types of games simply by arranging a set of switches in specific ways. The device used templates to show which switches to flip in what direction. 
This was the first truly programmable multiplayer video game unit. And they called it the Brown Box. They started to set up demonstrations of the units to show the concept to different TV manufacturers of the time. One of the companies they showed the Brown Box to was RCA, and they initially wanted to work together. But while working on negotiations, something didn't feel right with the partnership. Worrying that RCA was attempting to take advantage of them, they split from the agreement. But as fate would have it, a man who worked for RCA named Bill Enders. There are a lot of Bills in this story. <laughs> Anyways, Bill Enders had left RCA and was now a marketing VP at Magnavox. He visited the Nashua office to see the brown box in action once more and was still so impressed by it that he pushed for Magnavox to take a second look at the design. After meeting with Magnavox, Sanders Associates began negotiating with the company and by 1971, the details were all ironed out. Ralph and the team handed over the design data to Magnavox and production began on the first prototype of what would eventually become the Magnavox Odyssey TV game. The team originally wanted to call the console the Skillovision. Fortunately, that name did not stick. By December of 1971, the Odyssey's final specs had been nailed down. There would be two versions of the console. They were to operate on, you guessed it, channels three and four. The set would come with five games and 10 overlays with 10 more games planned to launch in August of 72. May 3rd of 1972, Magnavox started their traveling road show, which they called the Profit Caravan. These trips were planned to shop the Magnavox catalog of products to both dealers and the press. The caravan eventually landed in Burlingame, California, where it displayed on May 24th and 25th of 1972. On the first day of the show in Burlingame, a man came to check out what Magnavox had on display. At that time, he worked for Nutting Associates. He attended the product line and played the games the Odyssey had to offer. One of those games was a ping pong style game. He would later go on to steal that idea and create his own version called Pong. That man was none other than Nolan Bushnell. But that's a story for a later date. The Odyssey console officially launched in September of 1972, but not without hiccups. The console was featured in the Magnavox Fall advertising, but the way they advertised it made it seem like the console would only work on Magnavox TVs. I'm sure this was a marketing idea to sell more TVs, but it meant the console suffered. Secondly, the Odyssey was priced at $100. That's equivalent to around $750 now. Sure, the console ended up coming with six carts that allowed you to play 12 games by using the provided overlays, but if you wanted the light gun, it was going to cost another $25, which is the equivalent around $180 now. Not to mention, you could only purchase the units at franchised Magnavox dealers. And there weren't that many of them, so the console was not easy to find. From its release in 1972, the Magnavox Odyssey would remain the one and only home TV game console. That is until 1976, when another console entered the market. In our next episode, we'll cover the Fairchild Channel F, also known as the Fairchild Video Entertainment System. Thank you for watching episode one of Console Gaming History, and I'll see you next time.